everyone. Welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagnon with the Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech. And today I'm joining you from an active logging job um, in Franklin County, Virginia. And I have with me today my friends and colleagues, Andrew Vinson and Bill Sweeney, who both work for the Virginia Department of Forestry. So I'm gonna hand the microphone over to them and let them introduce themselves and lead us on our tour. Hey y'all, my name is Andrew Vinson. I'm a water quality specialist with the Virginia Department of Forestry. It's my job to work with landowners, loggers, and foresters across several counties to help protect the waters of the Commonwealth. Today we're going to take a look at some of the best management practices that loggers and forestry operations can take in order to protect water quality. Hi, my name is Bill Sweeney. I'm a forester here in Franklin County. I work for the Virginia Department of Forestry and it is my job to work with landowners to help them achieve their management goals for their property as well as help to enforce water quality, fight fires, and a, any number of other things. This tract here in Franklin County, that's approximately 500 acres, um, this landowner is working to reforest the property. So that in, entails uh, performing a clear cut on the property. And so I'll be working with them to reforest that clear cut. Having clean water in the Commonwealth is important because not only do we rely on clean water for drinking and household use, but uh, there's very many species of aquatic wildlife who also rely on having a clean habitat to thrive in. Pollution in waterways can impact a lot of the aquatic life found in the Commonwealth. Uh, pollution can alter a stream's chemistry. It can affect the, the bed of the stream and the type of material that's on it. It can change stream channel morphology or even the temperature of the water uh, that can be harmful to some of these aquatic species. Sediment has been identified as one of the leading pollutants that can come from forestry practices. Virginia has silvicultural water quality laws in place that we enforce on logging jobs and forestry operations uh, in order to prevent the introduction of sediment to the waterways of the Commonwealth. Uh, Bill Sweeney uh, and many of our other foresters and technicians around the, uh, the, the state inspect logging jobs regularly in order to uh, determine if there is a risk of sedimentation and water quality specialists and engineers such as myself work with foresters, loggers, and landowners in order to mitigate any concerns that may arise. I'm standing in a perennial stream here on the, uh, near this logging job and you can see that this stream is flowing today. It's a very hot day in the middle of summer, um, indicating that it tends to flow year round. It's a rather large stream. Uh, you can see how high the water gets sometimes by how much you know the mud is on the leaves or, or the, the rack line, we call it sometimes. Um, one thing that I wanna point out is how our, we have vegetation, trees specifically on both sides of the stream going up stream here. One important BMP or best management practice is having a streamside management zone or leaving a buffer as some people refer to it. Streamside management zones are buffers on our streams uh, which we try to limit the amount of harvesting or the amount of equipment traffic within the area uh, in order to reduce our impacts uh, directly next to the stream. Riparian buffers are important for trapping sediment. They have an undisturbed leaf litter or forest floor. This is, as a perennial stream, a, uh, a cold water stream which can bear fish. Um, it's important to note that in the state of Virginia, our, uh, our SMZ widths, our buffer widths on perennial and intermittent streams are 50 foot wide, on, from, measured from the top of the stream bank. However, whenever you get to a cold water fishery, we like to increase that SMZ width to about 75 feet from the stream bank. If it's a municipal water source, then we back that buffer up even further to about 100 feet from the stream bank. This helps to provide an adequate buffer for water that either humans or cold water fisheries are using. So as Andrew was mentioning, when we look at stream quality, we're not just looking at these larger perennial streams, but we're also looking at these smaller streams, these tributaries that actually feed into the larger stream. 
And sometimes it may not even be as obvious as this little creek here. Sometimes we're looking for ephemeral streams or streams that only run when it rains, as well as seeps and springs. A seep or a spring may not be obvious, especially when it's hot outside or you're experiencing a period of dry weather like we are now. Um, and so one of the things that I will look for as a forester are vegetative indicator species. So some of the vegetative indicator species that I will use to help identify a riparian area are box elder. We also have spice bush over here on the right. Um, there's some reedy species as well as smartweed. Um, and also we have rushes over here on the right. And rushes are always a great indicator species for a riparian area. Here we are standing on a stream crossing. This was a stream crossing used by some uh, timber harvesting equipment, a skitter, in order to take logs from one side of the creek to the other. As you can see, the, the bridge panels that were here are no longer here. Using bridge panels is a best management practice because it keeps both the machinery and the logs being dragged behind it up out of the creek and out of the water. Another best management practice is to use brush or the residual tops and limbs, sometimes called slash, from our timber harvesting operation uh, to create a brush mat on the approaches of the stream crossing. In this way, we hold some of the, the soil in place and we also create a non-erodible um, organic layer of material between the, uh, the, the traffic, the skitter traffic and the, the ground. Another BMP is to establish vegetation on areas that are disturbed after the harvest or after use. In this instance, soil here was not really disturbed, so you do see a resurgence of these native indicator species plants. Vegetation is established following uh, soil disturbance using seed and mulch or once again a brush mat. So with any logging job, obviously the loggers have to have a way of getting the logs off of the site into the market. And so in every tract, you're going to have what's called a haul road cut into the site. And uh, this haul road, because it's on very steep land, had a couple of issues with drainage. And so one of the things that we recommended and they executed very well were the installation of turnouts along this road. This particular turnout, you can see, has the remnants of some of the seed and straw that were also recommended to go along with that. And so sometimes it's not enough, especially with a small stream being nearby, to just have the turnout. There has to be a way of slowing that water down as well. And so having the mixture of a turnout as well as seed and straw and the brush that you see here is a good way to actually slow that water down from the road to the stream. Another reason for turnouts is to slow the velocity of water. And what does that mean? Uh, velocity of water is just the, the speed that it picks up coming down the hill. And what can happen when you have water moving very quickly down either a haul road or a skid trail is it can cause channelization. And so these turnouts, as well as water bars and other uh, water diversion devices help slow that water down so that it cuts down on potential erosion issues as well as sedimentation into a stream. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a clear cut. Um, the landowner that owns this piece of property is what's considered an industrial landowner. So they own many acres in Franklin County and they manage primarily for timber. So what was cut off of this site was predominantly hardwood, but what's gonna go back on the site is gonna be predominantly pine. They will leave some of the more mesic areas like north facing slopes and west facing slopes to come back in poplar, but predominantly this is gonna be a loblolly pine site. So one of the things I often hear from people who, who just aren't familiar with clear cuts is that what's going to be left is nothing, that a clear cut is a wasteland, that nothing will ever grow there. As you can see here, this clear cut is approximately a year old and it is completely vegetated. And so that vegetation 
will slow sedimentation, erosion, all the things that have a negative association with clear cuts. Standing on a skid trail here on this harvest site, uh, this is an abandoned skid trail. It was a temporary skid trail, which was used for a uh, skidder, the machine that's used to pull logs from the stump to an area where they're processed and loaded onto trucks. Uh, it's a low standard dirt road that is designed to be temporary. As you can see, we have some brush on this slash uh, residual debris. Uh, that does a couple of things. One, it adds organic matter to the soil. Two, it acts as a ground cover uh, to prevent erosion. And three, it also keeps other traffic off of these trails after they've been retired. This could be traffic from four wheelers. This could be traffic from pickup trucks. Another BMP that we can use on skid trails would be seed and mulch. We could come in here with uh, grass seed and mulch, straw mulch over the top in order to establish vegetation to make this area green. Another way we can close out skid trails is through the use of water bars. This is a, a berm of dirt that's built up in order to channel the water, the flow coming down the skid trail, off of the skid trail, and out into either a sediment trapping structure like a brush dam or the uh, undisturbed forest floor. Water bars create breaks in the grade of a skid trail to get water off of it. This prevents us from having one long continuous grade uh, trail that water can run down and channelize, thus creating more erosion. Water bars must have an outlet in order to drain, otherwise they won't function properly. The sediment you see here behind this water bar has come down off of the skid trail after the last rainstorm. It's important that as a landowner, if you want to maintain these water bars on your roads, that you sometimes come in here and clean them out and make sure that they're still functioning properly. Because over time, they may wear down or have traffic over them, which can reduce their effectiveness. Another BMP we see here on the skid trail is in the layout of the skid trail. We've kept this skid trail up away from the creek as far as we can in order to prevent any sediment, to reduce the risk of sediment from making it down to the stream. Standing on the logging deck, or log landing as it sometimes is called, uh, this is an area where trees or logs are brought to uh, a centralized location where it, they can be processed, merchandised, and then loaded onto trucks for hauling to the mill. Log landings, some of the best management practices for protecting water quality include keeping log landings and log decks uh, 50 feet outside of an SMZ, keeping them as far away from streams as possible, just because this is a, a large area of compacted soil, bare soil, that uh, you know can create some runoff. We also like to see water diversion structures on these uh, decks where needed. Um, we like to see them return to grade where possible if they become a little rutted. And also we like to see a vegetation established on these as well, whether it be seed and mulch or even, you know, using brush or chips to create sufficient organic ground cover. BMPs are not necessarily required unless there is a direct threat to water quality, in which case they are required. Every year we do an audit on logging jobs across the state of Virginia just to gauge how many or what percentage BMPs are being installed on our logging jobs voluntarily. We find that over the last couple years we're averaging around 90%, which is great. These BMPs can and should be included in a timber harvesting contract. Sometimes these BMPs do come at an extra cost though. There is cost share money available for landowners to put in some of these BMPs through the NRCS. For more information, contact your local county forester. Well, thank you for spending 15 minutes in the forest with us and thanks to Bill and thanks to Andrew for taking us on a tour and talking to us about best management practices. And be sure to join us next Friday at noon for another edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest. Have a great weekend. Remember, healthy forests produce clean water.